Hello there and welcome to Complete Games with me, James. Hope you guys are all doing well. And today we begin our Survivor Note read-through for Aberration. Aberration is often referred to as the Broken Arc. Its internal atmosphere is leaked away, resulting in a harsh surface with intense radiation. The intense radiation of the Aberration has led to incredible genetic mutations, resulting in new creatures with amazing abilities. And in my opinion, it was one of the hardest maps. Today we begin the note read-through for Helena Walker. She's the biologist from modern-day Australia, and she's the creator of all of the dossiers that we can find throughout the maps. She is, of course, the original survivor from the island and scorched earth, and I've already done all of the explorer notes for the island and scorched earth, so if you haven't seen those, go and check them ones out first to bring you up to speed. But in the last note from scorched earth and Helena, she left the map with Rockwell, and they were led to the exit by Wally Al-Azard, a character also known as Raya in that note read-through. So once again, I invite you to sit back, relax and enjoy the notes from Elena Walker on Aberration. Bloody hell, this place is weird. Don't get me wrong, it's fascinating too. Such an abundance of underground flora is completely unheard of. And because so many of the plants here are bioluminescent, the whole forest has an eerie beauty to it. That's just it though. Eerie is the operative word. I've been holding my rifle so tightly since we got here I swear I've left dints in the grip. We should have gone back to the island. People know us there. They might have offered help and supplies. Rockwell didn't want to hear it though. And I wasn't about to let him come here alone. You can't surprise me anymore, life, I said. After withens, golems and giant sandworms, I'm ready for anything. What about flying squid bat murder monsters, Life replied. Well, that's mildly surprising, I conceded. By which I mean, I shot and cursed at them things all afternoon. At least, when I wasn't running from them. Thankfully, after thinning their numbers a little, they've decided that Rockwell and I aren't worth the trouble. Let's hope they don't change their minds. I'm not sure I have enough ammunition to fend them off again. And yes... I know that SFBMM is not the most scientific of monocles, but I'm bloody upset with them right now, so that's what I'm calling them, along with some other names I'd rather not write down. While I can't say I'm enamoured with the station's wildlife, I'm certainly grateful for its abundance of natural resources, particularly water. The permeability of the rocks here is astounding. The cavern walls are wet with condensation and the floor is littered with pools of water. After all that time in the desert, this is one change I can welcome with open arms. Thank God for hydration. I don't just mean that for my own sake either. Rockwell seems distracted. The other day, I had to keep him from walking headlong into a poisonous mushroom. He wouldn't fare well in a harsher environment. Then again, at his age, I'm sure I'd lose a step too. There's no mistaking it, that was a giant armoured mole rat. Thankfully, it wasn't aggressive, so I was able to get a good look at it. Its appearance made me realise something that I'd taken for granted. Every creature I've encountered has some basis on either a known species or human legend. Golems and wyverns never existed on Earth, but humans did write stories about them. Even the SFBMMs, I'm still cross with them, appear to be a pastiche of known fauna. What does that mean? Are the creators of these stations human? Do they merely possess extensive knowledge of humans or am I grasping at straws? I can't say, but it's worth pondering. The FSB double M's returned, and I was right. I didn't have the firepower to fight them off. Luckily, someone else did. It was incredible. I've never seen a human move that fast. One second, I'm a dead woman, and the next there's someone in glowing silver armor tearing through those creatures like they were dodos. One got punched so hard it skipped off the cavern floor. As if a superhuman saviour wasn't enough. When they lifted their visor, I found a familiar face. It was Mei Yin. It took me a good minute to form a sentence after that. I must have looked like a complete dipstick. Because I swear, she almost laughed. At least I'm a living dipstick. And with her around, I might just stay that way. What's the saying? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. On the island, I wasn't sure where I stood with Mei Yin, but now we've been catching up like best mates. She's apologised for socking me in the face. I learned how she arrived here, and that she got her new scar while battling Nerva to death. You know, best mate things. 
She also introduced us to some of her new allies at her camp. And here's where it gets loony. They're from the future. Well, my future anyway. It all fits, doesn't it? I never met anyone from my future before. But Mei Yin and Rockwell are from my past. And the technology here is beyond anything from my present. Clearly the current year is far beyond 2008. But by how much? The journey to the village was a bit tricky. Since Rockwell and I lack the high-tech armour the others wear, they had to help us along with rope ladders and zip lines. We made it eventually though, and it's quite a sight. The technology this tribe uses is incredible. Although, Rockwell was far more intrigued by it than I was. Mei Yin's friend, Diana, gave us a grand tour and he pelted her with questions the whole time. Fortunately, Diana just smiled and answered his questions patiently. Apparently she was a pilot in her own time which is the same era her fellow villagers are from. That there are so many people from the same time period on one station seems unusual. I wonder what it means. I have to convince them to stop. There's no way the station will allow this. This place would never allow anyone to master it. If it weren't for Raya's warning, I'd be ecstatic about what they were creating. A gateway that can help us escape the station and reach the planet below? It's brilliant but the obelisks will kill everyone here before we can complete it. Just like they destroyed the village Raya told me about, I'm sure of it. Bloody hell, I'm gonna look like an absolute mad woman. I've barely settled in here and I'm already coming to them with doomsday prophecies. I need to convince Mei Yin and Diana first. They're my best bet. The tribe's leadership was surprisingly receptive to my ideas, but still a bit skeptical. Apparently they've already fiddled with one of the obelisks and even damaged this station's control center. So while they believe my account of what happened in the desert, they think the threat is already contained. Thankfully, Diana convinced them to lend me a small team to inspect the obelisk, just in case. Better than nothing at least. However, on this station, getting to an obelisk is something of a risky proposition. To reach them, we need to make a trip to the surface, which even Mei Yin says is dangerous. That means before I go, I need to get a crash course on that armour. My time in the desert may have given me some skill with firearms and helped me get fit, despite failing to give me washboard abs, much to my chagrin, but I'm still no soldier. That was evident to anyone who saw me flailing around in the training yard these past few days. If it wasn't for Mei Ying and Diana, I'd still be crashing my tech armour into rocks and tripping myself over like a drunken dodo. Plus. I always feel a little less silly when someone's around to laugh at my mistakes along with me. Fortunately, Mei Ying will be accompanying me to the obelisks, so this whole thing won't rest on my unsteady armoured hands, thank god. Mei Ying and I set out yesterday, alongside a bespeckled computer expert named Santiago. He'll be the one to actually examine the obelisk. He claims he can hack into its terminal, if it is preparing to unleash a surge of power, as I suspect then he says he might be able to reroute it. Rockwell, for his part, is staying behind. He's been aiding the villagers' scientists in their studies since he's arrived and has become rather engrossed. Every other sentence with him is about that bloody metal he named after himself, but thankfully Diana said she'd look after him. I can't spend time worrying about Rockwell now, though the fate of that whole village might depend on this expedition. Focus up, Elena. Let's do this. The structure of this space station must be vastly different from the others to allow for these massive caverns. Is that uncommon? Or do so many of these stations vary so radically from one to the other? I've only seen three. For all I know, they could come in all shapes and sizes. Speaking of different, Mei Yin's been fairly talkative since we left. At least for her. She'll still grow quiet sometimes. But instead of trying to burn me to death with invisible eye lasers, she stares into the distance and idly fiddles with her necklace. I think it depicts a plane or spaceship of some kind. I wonder where she got it. They weren't exaggerating when they said the surface was dangerous. Direct exposure to sunlight during the day will quickly burn a human to a crisp. Even in this fancy armour. That means we have to adjust our sleep schedules and wait just below the surface until night falls. When it does we'll make a mad dash for the obelisk. Let Santiago get in as much work as he dares, then run our asses back to safety. Struth, I thought that bloody desert was diabolical, but this tops it for sure. Why couldn't we do something simple, like flee from a pack of ravenous allosauruses or something? This life I lead, I swear. 
Santiago is still going over his readings from last night, but even without them, it seemed clear that the obelisk was behaving oddly. It was pulsing wildly and the ground beneath it received regular tremors, as if the whole station was on the verge of tearing itself apart. If this obelisk goes off, it could mean Armageddon for every living thing here. Despite this, Santiago is insisting on analysing his readings. The scientist in me is proud of his dedication to hard evidence, but that part of me would rather not be obliterated by a mysterious high-tech space station. I really wish he would hurry the hell up. The Gateway Project needs to be abandoned. There's no other way, is there? We shared our findings with the village by radio. Santiago's analysis confirmed what I suspected. The obelisks are highly unstable. They could be days away from reacting. However, Santiago raised a good point. Even if the Gateway Project is shut down, we can't say for sure that would stabilize the obelisks. It may be too late to dissuade the station from destroying the village. The only way to ensure our survival is to shut down the obelisks themselves. According to Santiago, we can't do that from the obelisk platforms. But we may be able to manipulate said platforms to teleport us somewhere we could. Specifically into the heart of the station itself. It's a huge risk, but it may be the only hope we have. And that concludes part one of Helena Walker's note read through on Aberration. Don't forget to let me know in the comments down below if you're enjoying this series throughout December. We of course will be continuing the note read through tomorrow with the conclusion of Helena's story and we'll be going through the rest of the survivors on Aberration throughout December. Of course, if you're new here, consider subscribing for more art content from myself. I am doing a complete game series and we're currently on Scorched Earth, but we've just skipped ahead in December to bring the requested note series. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games, and I'll see you.